Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Liz Kirkwood, Executive Director of Flow for Love of Water, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our groundwater webinar and concurrent release of our new groundwater report, Deep Threats to Our Sixth Great Lake, Spotting and Solving Michigan's Groundwater Emergency. Our mission at Flow is to protect the common waters of the Great Lakes Basin and to ensure access to safe, affordable, and clean water for all. Our groundwater program is part of our multi-year commitment to protect one of the least protected arcs of the water cycle. That is essential to both quality and quantity of Michigan's wetlands, lakes, streams, and the Great Lakes. We'd like to give special thanks to the Harry A. and Margaret D. Towsley Foundation and the Andrew R. and Janet F. Miller Foundation for their generous support to make this work possible. In contrast to modern laws and policies protecting surface water since the 1960s and 70s, water policies have been piecemeal, resulting in fragmented protections that expose this freshwater resource to continued degradation and future public health risks. Despite increasing scientific understanding about threats to groundwater and its importance to the healthy sustainability of life, uses, and our communities in the watershed, Groundwater's out of sight character has often led protective policies out of mind. Without rivers on fire and catastrophic oil spills, groundwater emergencies have not captured the hearts and minds of our citizens and lawmakers. It's well past time for Michigan to remedy that. Dealing with threats from toxic chemicals, agricultural pollutants and failing septic systems. Deep threats to our sixth great lake proposes an overarching comprehensive solution to state law and policy, a Michigan Groundwater Protection Act to prevent groundwater contamination while holding accountable those who pollute this shared public resource. Such a solution is critical now and will become increasingly so in this century. As Michigan's public waters, including groundwater, will face new demands with population growth, indus industries relocating, in the face of water shortages and climate change pressures elsewhere. Today, Flo's senior advisor and writer, Dave Dempsey, will host an engaging conversation about the invisible resource of groundwater with panelist Dr. Carrie Jennings, policy and research director for the Freshwater Society, and Dr. Alan Steinman for the Annis Water Research Institute at Grand Valley State University. It's our hope that today's conversation will start a renewed dialogue and commitment to find common understanding and solutions to groundwater management protection. To this end, we at Flow are coordinating a groundwater table of diverse stakeholders, thanks to the generous funding from the American Americana Foundation. Before we start this conversation, I'd like to introduce our host, Dave Dempsey, is one of the deepest thinkers I know on Great Lakes history and policy. With over 35 years of environmental policy experience, he has served as environmental advisor to former Michigan Governor James Blanchard and as policy advisor on the staff of the International Joint Commission. He's also worked at several leading environmental nonprofits during his career. And we are particularly lucky to have Dave serve as Flo's senior advisor for the past four years providing us critical historical insights to navigate today's complex landscape of securing environmental justice and stewardship of our Great Lakes. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dave Dempsey and I hope that you find today's conversation engaging, fruitful, and thank you for participating. Thank you, Liz, and welcome to everybody for um, taking the time to listen and learn not only about our new groundwater report from Flow, but also some other important groundwater projects and news of relevance to Michigan that my fellow presenters will be discussing. As the famous philosopher and New York Yankees catcher Yogi Berra is alleged to have said, the situation we find ourselves in with respect to groundwater feels like deja vu all over again. Almost 37 years ago, working for the governor of Michigan, I attended a news conference in which his groundwater protection strategy was announced. This came at a time when Michigan and America were facing a reckoning after years of mismanagement of groundwater. Love Canal, Superfund, Berlin and Farrow, Hooker Chemical, groundwater contamination sites were everywhere we looked. 
the legislature and Congress appropriated hundreds of millions of dollars to clean them up. But cleanup wasn't enough. Preventing new contamination was necessary to save taxpayer money and public health. The governor's strategy contained some successful elements, but it obviously did not solve the problem. Today, we have as many or more contamination sites than we did back in the early 80s, and it will take us decades to address them all. That's not good enough. What we have had, what we have now and have had is a slow motion groundwater crisis, an emergency that never goes away, but also gets little attention because it is out of sight until something like green ooze forces us to pay attention. And so Flo is proposing today a groundwater strategy for our times, one based on the premise that groundwater is not something we should sacrifice nor can afford to sacrifice, but something to protect and restore. We owe it to ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. Before beginning, I want to acknowledge the many people who have contributed to this report. Alex Theophilus, Zoe Gum, our board member, Rick Kane, our Flow founder, Jim Olson, and our policy committee chair, Skip Press. After I make my presentation, I will be introducing the two other speakers who will then of course make their presentation. And then we'll take questions from the audience for any of the three speakers. So now, Nate, we're gonna start with the slides. What we're going to be talking about today uh, is the importance of groundwater, some recent good news and bad news, spotlight on some of the threats, building blocks and recommendations. Next slide, please. I don't think I should have to tell you too much about why groundwater matters. I assume you're here because you already know that and believe in it, but about 45% of Michiganders rely on groundwater for their drinking water. And it's a, uh, an important fact to know that we have more private wells than any other state in the country. And we use groundwater for irrigation, public water supply and industry. What I think is not well known and well understood is that much of the volume of the Great Lakes originates from groundwater, which either discharges directly to the lakes or more, far more significantly discharges to lakes and rivers, inland lakes and rivers, and then to the Great Lakes. Next slide, please. I wanna make sure that everybody knows that um, we're not saying that there's a great lake underneath Michigan. One of our gadfly followers on Facebook, every time I talk about the Sixth Great Lake points out that it's not a lake, it's uh, water that's trapped between the pores of soil and rock. But the analogy of the Sixth Great Lake comes from science scientists, groundwater scientists, who as in this report here have pointed out that the groundwater in the Great Lakes Basin is roughly equal in volume to the uh, volume of Lake Huron. Next slide, please. So there's been good news since our first report, which we put out in late, late summer of 2018. Since that report, there's been new funding appropriated for cleanup by the legislature through something called the Renew Michigan Fund. Michigan has become one of the few states to regulate uh, seven of the most common PFAS compounds in drinking water by promulgating maximum contaminant levels through rules. And now Governor Whitmer is calling for a $35 million fund for loans to replace failing septic systems. That's all good news. Next slide. Of course, uh, green news has been in the headlines for over a year now, and that's the um, contaminated groundwater that was discharging to I-696 in Madison Heights the result of a, a contamination site that was ad addressed in part, but not in whole, if some of the groundwater was allowed to remain and then traveled uh, to the freeway next, next door. Sort of a symbol of the many sites that we have in Michigan that are, uh, continue to have contamination even after they're addressed by government. Next slide, please. As many of you know, Michigan is the only state in the nation without a uniform statewide septic code. And there's an estimated 130,000 leaking septic systems nationwide or statewide, many of which um, are leaking to groundwater and to surface water. We're finding uh, widespread bacteriological contamination. We have about 14,000 contamination sites which lack adequate funding for a cleanup around Michigan. And we have contaminated groundwater that's flowing into our lakes and streams. Next slide, please. Here are some of the many threats to our groundwater. Uh, today, I'll just address 
I'm just addressing the septic systems of nitrates from agricultural practices and the legacy of contamination sites. Next slide. I already mentioned the failing septic systems. One of the problems that we're seeing that uh, has emerged in recent years is the problem of vapor intrusion into uh, buildings. Back in 1995, Michigan uh, passed what was called a land use based policy for contamination. Previously, the policy was to, in essence, for most sites, clean up contaminants to drinking water standards. And some regarded that as not pragmatic and not a good use of, of funds. So restrictions were required to theoretically prevent public exposure to contamination while leaving that contamination in the ground. One thing we did not anticipate then is that some of the volatile contaminants would uh, be able to vaporize through the foundations or basements of buildings and get into the um, indoor air and therefore threaten the health of um, many people in those indoor environments. So uh, there have been several places around Michigan where people have had to leave their residences or offices while that problem is addressed after some period of time where they may have been exposed to contamination. Next slide, please. One of the local issues in our, our Traverse City area where flow is based has to do with PFAS groundwater contamination, which uh, has flowed, we believe, from perhaps the local airport or Coast Guard training facilities where firefighting foams may have been used. Um, over a dozen homes have been identified with drinking water wells that have PFAS in excess of the drinking water standard. And that neighborhood is now being connected or will be connected to a municipal water supply to deal with that issue. Next slide, please. I'm sure many of you are familiar with one of the largest groundwater contamination plumes in the country, which is the Mancelona plume that has flowed miles to near uh, the Shanty Creek Resort. It's a 13 trillion gallon contamination plume with TCE. So far it's cost taxpayers $27 million to hook people up to municipal water or yeah, to municipal water supplies. Just isn't deemed cost effective to re, re address that entire plume. Next slide, please. One of the things we talk about in the report is the need for a more sensible chemical policy, both at the state level and the national level. TCE, which is a solvent contaminant, has contaminated more than 300 sites in Michigan. In the latter days of the Trump administration, EPA released a finding that 52 of the 54 remaining TCE uses present unreasonable health risks. Minnesota actually last year took uh, action as the first state in the country to strictly limit TCE use because of concerns about TCE contamination of water and air in Minnesota. Next slide, please. Some of the building blocks that we'd like to see Michigan take on for groundwater policy reform include establishing a state policy for groundwater. Some of the states that are most progressive in dealing with groundwater have done so already. New Hampshire and Minnesota are two cases. We also believe there needs to be a focal point for groundwater protection in government. There are numerous programs, including several departments beyond uh, EGLE and the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development that have responsibilities for groundwater. We think that needs to be pulled together so that there's some overarching um, coordination of what policy should be. We'd like to see uh, groundwater polluting chemicals like TCE addressed, if not at the federal level, at the state level. Michigan has a history of attacking toxic contaminants, even when federal government uh, standards have not been put in place. Rural wells are obviously not monitored on a regular basis for contaminants, and we'd like to see funding set up to assist rural homeowners in getting that, their water tested. Perhaps most importantly, we need stronger prevention policies to enable us to pr protect groundwater from being further contaminated in the future. Next slide. So again, we'd like to see reforms in chemical policy to prevent contamination. Um, no, no new chemicals should be allowed in the street without scientific proof that they're uh, consistent with public health. 
Our next slide, please. So in, in essence, in summation, we want to see a state policy for groundwater, protecting groundwater for its highest use in the future, uh, not permitting prohibition or dead zones where groundwater cannot be used, providing more money for cleanup of contamination, better in, uh, prevention and enforcement and health studies to deal with concerns, citizen concerns about contamination and its impact on their health. Next slide. So for our audience and for our public that we're releasing this report to here is some examples of activities that can be undertaken to protect our groundwater. So that's the presentation. I'm going to introduce um, our next speaker, Carrie Jennings. Carrie joined what's called Freshwater now in 2016. She's been a field geologist with extensive experience in groundwater for 24 years 22 of those with the Minnesota Geological Survey and two with the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. For the last two years, she was the science reports lead for the County Geologic Atlas Program at the DNR. She applies her understanding of glacial geology and landscape evolution to shape policy and technical approaches for managing surface water and groundwater. Carrie and her husband live on a 120 acre farm, which is primarily in a permanent conservation easement through the Dakota County Farmland and Natural Areas Program. She has a bachelor's in geology from Northwestern University, a master's and PhD in geology from the University of Minnesota. So Carrie, why don't you go ahead? Okay, are you seeing my screen now? Starting to. Okay. I think this might be a slow presentation. I was mentioning earlier that there's a storm moving through Dakota County and Minnesota right now. So um, thank you for that great introduction, Dave. And I'm gonna start my stopwatch so I don't go over time. I appreciate the last comments you were making about the need for um, a different governance structure for groundwater in Michigan. And that really allows me to talk about this year long project with, that we just started last week, which is looking at groundwater governance in the Great Lakes region. We're comparing government structures from Minnesota to Ohio, including the tribal authorities within those geographic areas to hopefully establish a community of practice and see what the best practices are and any gaps. So I think that you've appropriately introduced the, the concept of, of groundwater and how our Great Lakes might seem unfathomable. And it only occurred to me recently that that means that you can't see the bottom of it, you know? And I, I was thinking about this in a recent trip across Lake Michigan, a friend of mine saved his whole life and retired from the phone company and bought a used sailboat in Milwaukee. And I helped him sail it from Milwaukee to Duluth um, for two week, a two week trip. And as we crossed Lake Michigan, you know, we saw some very deep water. But of course, as we got north of the UP, we got into the deepest parts of the Great Lakes where our depth finder wouldn't even record what the depth actually was. So for two weeks, I was able to have my freshwater office kind of at the back of this sailboat um, and think really concretely about the Great Lakes. And if you are close to any of these Great Lakes, and I know Michigan has the lar longest coastline in the country, um, then you do have access to plentiful, abundant water. Um, but if you're very far away at, you know, if you're even a couple miles inland, this is not an achievable source of water for you. I, there's not, um, it's not a mistake that the largest cities in the Great Lakes are located directly on the waterfront or on major rivers because metropolitan areas just aren't supported very well by groundwater. It's only smaller cities and private wells. I think though, once you move inland, you encounter another issue, which is, the unfathomable nature of the thickness of the glacial sediment that might be potentially holding the water. If you look at this map released by the USGS of the sediment thickness de deposited during the Quaternary, the glacial period, you'll see that the areas that exceed 600 feet are in the lower peninsula of Michigan and out in southwestern Minnesota and, the, and South Dakota. And to me as an academic, 
researcher of glacial glaciation, this is a huge potential for understanding what happened in the last um, 1.58 million years. But it also means that you have stacks and stacks of sediment that's deposited. Some sediment is water bearing and may potentially be a source of water for you, but it's probably not very well um, outlined. In a way, you can kind of think of that sediment having been derived from the basins themselves. And here's a map created by Bob Regis, who was looking, made the first bathymetry I had seen of the ba Great Lakes combining it with the topography of the land. And you can see those, the deepest parts of Lake Superior north of the UP are in the channels that were glacially of glacial origin. And that deposited a lot of sand on the UP and also the sand on the Northwest portion of the lower peninsula of Michigan. These channels discharged volumes of water and sand. They, they kind of cut into the pre-existing glacial deposits, but they left that really thick stack. That's the, the plateau in yellow there. So a lot of Michigan is unknown to geologists um, just because they haven't had the um, resources to drill enough holes to really understand and there aren't exposures of this material at the surface. And it's a complicated glacial history. Michigan, this just shows one stage in the deglaciation of Michigan, but you had ice coming at you from all directions, um, focused by the major basins and then also coming on land from the north. And these met at various places on the, what I call the peninsula of Michigan. And then the, also you had various stages of the Great Lakes that invaded land at times, made the huge channels cutting across at Grand Valley and farther north. And it's just a really, really interesting and, and complex history. The only other place that's um, remotely similar to this that has the same kind of glacial deposits overlying similar bedrock units is in Northern Europe. And that would be um, Norway and Sweden and, and Finland would be the equivalent to Canada. And then Germany, Denmark, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia would be like the states on the south side of the Great Lakes. Um, this is the farming region and the, the the kind of the heart of the economy of Europe and the European Union. And it is because of the glacial sediment overlying the bedrock units and the abundant groundwater that's essential to support these economies. However, as you probably can dem demise from this map, the Baltic Sea is not a series of Great Lakes. Um, the glaciation there opened it up to the Atlantic. So it's a saltwater body. So the Great Lakes really are unique in the world. Just a little bit of um, geology trivia. Uh, it's probably going to eventually be open to the sea. Um, and that will depend on how quickly Niagara Falls migrates from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. Um, this is kind of the thing that's holding the sea back. So as the waterfall retreats up the Niagara River, and we know it does that because we can see the Niagara Gorge and that it has already moved quite a bit up the Niagara River. Um, once it reaches Lake Erie, because of the very different elevations of water level, if you just project that water level that you see in Lake Ontario to the left in that diagram or upstream in the Great Lakes, you'll see that we pretty much lose Lake Erie and Lake Huron become significantly lower. Now, before you start really freaking out about this, geologists speak on a different timeline. <laughs> and this is something that's in the distant future, but it is inevitable that this will happen um, if because we can't keep waterfalls from moving. But let's return our focus to, to groundwater and this question about where the groundwater is in this thick stack of glacial sediment. And actually I've been in Michigan with somebody who believed in um, using a water witch or a divining rod to find groundwater. Um, but really the best way to understand where groundwater is through is through a systematic campaign of geologic mapping where you define which units are water bearing and which units prohibit the movement of water or aquitards. And this is a picture from Northwest Michigan that shows clearly to me, and I hope to you as well, that there's a pebbly unit at the surface that looks like it was deposited by a stream. There are coarser layers of pebbles and then sand in between. Some of those even look wet to me, they're darker. That's an aquifer. 
and it's at the surface, but that doesn't mean it's not an aquifer. And then below it, it looks like that gravel is inset into something that's finer grained. That's most likely an aquitard. I imagine that's deposited directly by a glacier. I can't tell from this distance in this picture, but I, I remember enough of the field trip context that that's the case. So in addition to just mapping these two different types of materials, it's helpful to know where the aquifers receive water or the recharge areas. And that would be where rain soaks into the ground um, and where they discharge. And you can think of the discharge areas as being any place where there is water um, going to a stream or a lake or a wetland. And then if you want to get even more technical, it's helpful to know how long that water is residing underground. There are different ways to date water um, and to estimate the, you know, the storage of water underground. A lot of our groundwater in Minnesota, and I suspect this is case, the case in Michigan too, was emplaced underneath the last ice sheet. So it hasn't been recharged for 14,000 years. And it really takes the weight of a you know, half mile thick sheet of ice to push the water deep into the ground again. And then it's helpful to understand how the water actually moves and the flow and if it flows easily or, or less easily through the, the different aquifers. So it's helpful to understand what the status of current knowledge and tools are for your state. Um, I've benefited from some recent field trips um, led by Kevin Kincare at the USGS and seen some exposures in Northwest Michigan. And I know the USGS is doing some active mapping and that the USGS is also, and I mean United States Geological Survey is also the entity that is, um, has the monitoring wells in your state. And monitoring wells are just looking at the groundwater levels over time and how those change. Um, and so the status of your mapping and monitoring and modeling is something that helps you understand what the tools are that you have to address these subsequent issues of groundwater pollution. I do wanna focus here though on just where the water is, the quantity and the sustainable use of that water that's there. So in all of these Great Lakes states um, that were glaciated that we're studying and this map of the bedrock geology is simplified. It does extend east into Pennsylvania, New York, and Ontario, but those are not um, topics of our current study. Um, but in all of these states, the glacial sediment overlies fairly flat lying bedrock units. Most of the bedrock units were deposited in a seaway at some point in geologic time. So you'll see a series of rocks like limestone and sandstone and shale. This is a, a picture in a quarry in Northwest Ohio that is very much like the stratigraphy or the layers that you would see in southeastern Michigan, um, the southeastern part of the Michigan basin. And these bedrock layers are a little easier to understand which units are the aquifers and aquitards. Um, those are laterally very much more extensive units. They cross the, your whole state and into other states. So these water layers, the aquifers are shared across broad areas and are more predictable in the case of Michigan, it's probably um, prohibitively expensive to drill to these layers for a domestic well. Cities might have the money to access these wells um, where the glacial sediment is thinner. But we'll hear from the next speaker how these bedrock aquifers have their own issues as well. So I just wanna keep looking at my time here. So I think the fundamental question for quantity is um, who and what do you share your groundwater with? So neighboring cities might share groundwater, the same aquifer with each other. And then you're also sharing your aquifers with these surface water features that rely on them. Another question might be, are there regional trends and do you understand them? And that's where these monitoring wells come into play. In Minnesota, we, you might remember from the other map, we don't have any USGS monitoring wells. That's because we have a robust um, network of state monitoring wells and requests every year to add more. And this shows the mixed signal we're getting from these aquifers. Green means the water levels are increasing, red means they're decreasing, and yellow means the trend is not clear. And so it's a mixed signal probably because we're a bit like Michigan in that we have many different aquifers and these wells are probably finished in different layers. And so the first thing to sort out is which layers 
are we looking at in these monitoring systems? In one specific example, in a town in West Central Minnesota, kind of near the county labeled 17B, um, we see a decline of 15 feet in the water levels. And digging into that a little bit more, we can look at the permitting information for that city and see that the use of water over time has changed. The overall use has increased significantly, even though the population hasn't grown, industry hasn't changed, the golf course is not watering anymore. But what's happened is irrigation has moved into the area. And so the trend, the increase goes with the increase in irrigation. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The community might need to have irrigated agriculture as the conditions are becoming drier, but it really pits the decision makers in this city to make this critical decision against agriculture and drinking water. In Minnesota, we do have a priority of water usage. Drinking water always comes first um, and these other uses come later. Um, recreation would also include things like um, snowmaking in addition to golf courses. So cities all over are facing these decisions even though they don't really understand the extents of their aquifers or the sustainable use. We also might ask the question, you know, what principles are guiding the shared use of groundwater? The map that is here that with the shades of purple and red is a map of our seven county metropolitan area in southeast Minnesota. Um, the the tw Twin Cities or Minneapolis and St. Paul are located in these counties. So are the first and second ring suburbs. This is a, a really broad metropolitan area. And the Mississippi does cut through. That's the kind of jagged boundary in the middle. Um, but you can see that there are significant projected depressions in the water table or the, the bedrock aquifer that's modeled here in just 10 years. And in some places, if the suburbs keep pumping at the rate that they are now, we're going to draw down more than 50% of the saturated level in that aquifer. Um, the, the suburbs are worse than the metropolitan core, and that's because the metropolitan area switched to surface water a while ago because they had already significantly drawn down the aquifers. And so Minneapolis and St. Paul both use the Mississippi River. The suburbs also see a huge increase in summer water usage, and that's because they water lawns and they have big expansive lawns that don't have a lot of shade. So we, we have um, conservation efforts in place among the metropolitan um, suburbs, but we also have a metropolitan council that helps kind of negotiate across these political jurisdictions. And there are groups that work across cities and counties. We even have to think about working across state boundaries um, with Wisconsin and the Dakotas and tribal jurisdictions in other parts of the state. Um, currently, we don't work across any major groundwater divides, but if you start having to do that in your state, um, it's, they're not necessarily the same as surface water divides and they move. Um, with pumping. So there are a lot of things that you have to think about when you're sharing groundwater resources. Another overarching question is who's in charge of planning for change? Um, we can't assume that uh, land use or the amount of recharge and rain we get is going to stay constant into the future. And yet we need to be able to plan. In Minnesota, what we're seeing in the map on the right, we have water supply in red, but we see irrigation wells in black. And we're seeing a lot more irrigated agriculture moving farther north as the climate warms and corn is able to be grown farther north. So we're seeing some stressors and well interference in exactly the part of the state that is more susceptible to drought conditions. In Minnesota, like in Michigan, we have um, a lot of different agencies that are looking at groundwater. You don't need to know what these acronyms are, but you know they each play a role. The agencies that play a role most in quantity of groundwater are our Department of Natural Resources because they oversee the role of groundwater in ecosystem services and our Department of Health because they oversee municipal wells. The other agencies, though, they, they mainly play a role in water quality issues. So 
as Dave pointed out, we do have um, pretty robust policies in place in Minnesota. We're curious to see what that looks like in the rest of the states in our study area. Um, one of the ways that we've been able to advance our policies is by stable funding sources. We have a constitutional amendment that dedicates part of our sales tax to water quality and quantity topics. And we also use lottery money. Um, but the questions we'll be asking to see if other states are similar are, does water level monitoring drive permit making? Like, do you limit the amount of permits depending on what the monitoring wells are telling you? Are you paying attention to those ecosystem services that groundwater provides? If a county or city has created a groundwater plan for a decade, does that give them some kind of prioritization or you know, right to use that water? And are there any tools available if pressures start coming from outside the state or the basin? We had a recent example last legislative session where Progressive Rail um, was proposing, was applying for a permit to drill a well in my county and ship that water by train to somewhere in the desert southwest. And this is a picture from their website. Um, fortunately, the aquifer they were targeting had special protections. It's our deepest aquifer that's off limits to any of the cities even. But um, it had a scrambling for you know, what was possible to do to protect the water. And if these conflicts do come up, we, we want to understand the tools that have been devised to address them and what other states are doing, you know, if it is a constitutional amendment, or if it goes to the courts, what the statutes and ordinances are or administrative rules or other compacts such as treaties that um, control or somehow help negotiate these conflicts. So we didn't create this groundwater governance um, structure. We're kind of modeling our approach to studying groundwater governance based on some other work. This uh, is one rubric that was developed by the World Bank. We're doing something similar and we will begin um, reaching out to the states, but we think what's important to do first to lessen the burden on your state governments is to do our homework and really read through all the existing documents, examples of talks that have been given, and understand what has already been done in the Great Lakes states. And then we do plan to involve the key people in each tribe and state in this region find out who's doing the work, whether formally designated or informally. And we do want to build relationships with these people so that we can establish this community that can share best practices, lessons learned, and their capacity challenges and data gaps. We have a huge team. I'm running out of time. And you can look at the link that's being provided in the chat to see who's all on our team. But our nonprofit is a lot like Flow, a little bigger. And we work closely with the University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Policy. And we have Dr. Bonnie Keeler's lab group working with us um, to help us with tribal relations. We have Mary Minnie Deeds and Ann um, McGammon Soltis from Glyphwick. And a lot of, and then Linda Reed from Water 365. The others are students and employees of the organizations already mentioned. So, um, I'm just going to end here with my Great Lake of origin. I'm from Ohio, born in Indiana, from Ohio, schooled in Illinois, and vacationed in Michigan and Wisconsin. So I feel like I'm, I'm going to study my whole life's history. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, appreciate that. It was a very interesting presentation. And now we're going to hear from Dr. Alan Steinman. Many of you know him. He's the um, Alan and Helen Hunting Director of the Grand Valley State University's Annis Water Resources Institute, where he's been since 2001. Al is previously Director of the Lake Okeechobee Restoration Program at the South Florida Water Management District. He's published over 180 scientific articles, book chapters, and books, and has been, excuse me, been awarded over $60 million in grants for scientific and engineering projects, testify before Congress and the Michigan and Florida state legislatures. Among his awards are Phi Beta Kappa, Fellow of the Society for Freshwater Science, 2017 Award of Excellence from the National Garden Clubs, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Outstanding Planning Achievement Award. He's a member of science advisory boards for the Great Lakes Advisory Board of U.S. EPA, the International Joint Commission currently serves as associate editor for the journal Freshwater Biology. He's also served on the state of Michigan's Groundwater Conservation Advisory Council and Phosphorus Advisory Committees. He has a postdoctoral research fellowship from 
Oak Ridge National Laboratory, PhD in Botany and Aquatic Ecology from Oregon State University, MS in Botany from University of Rhode Island, and a BS in Botany from University of Vermont. Wow, Al, I'm really impressed. Um, it's great. And you'll be talking to us about a Ottawa County groundwater study and also an upcoming Michigan groundwater summit. Take it away, Al. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, and hopefully you can see my slides so I can move forward. The first project I want to talk about is this groundwater summit. It's going to be held in a couple of months. It's been delayed a year due to COVID. And it is by invitation only. So this is largely a FYI for the audience out there. But basically, we're going to be addressing the groundwater challenges in Michigan as a template for the Great Lakes. And it's a nice complement to what Kerry is doing uh, across the entire Great Lakes. It's funded by the Cooperative Institute of Great Lakes Research, or SIGLER. And that's um, in partnership with NOAA, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. And I just want to give a shout out to them. Uh, SIGLER is, uh, consists of a network of institutions around the Great Lakes that all partner with NOAA, uh, basically to enhance their research portfolio and train the future water stewards of the Great Lakes. Uh, the goal is to make sure that that research is actionable to uh, improve the safety, health, uh, maintain the communities of the Great Lakes and restore the ones that need restoration. The summit itself consists of four major goals. One is that we want to inventory the key challenges facing groundwater in Michigan. And Dave and Flo have made our jobs a lot easier. All we need to do is steal from their reports. Uh, identify the knowledge gaps and scientific needs, as well as policy recommendations associated with these challenges. And we'll steal from Carrie for that. So half the summit's already done. Uh, we want to construct a set of conceptual models uh, with special focus because groundwater is such a huge issue as you've been listening to over the last two talks. We want to focus particularly on agriculture, wetlands, and urban groundwater as the features. And then finally, develop a list of, of actionable items that can be taken to address these challenges. We don't want these really to be, um, you know, uh, blue sky kinds of things, things that are truly tractable. And again, some of those recommendations, no doubt, will uh, parallel those that Flo are recommending, uh, but also look at things from a, perhaps a more technical point of view as well. I want to identify the people that are involved with the summit, uh, the steering committee, um, I'm the PI on this, but we also have folks from Noah Glural, Philip Chu and Lauren Fry, uh, Patrick Doran from the Nature Conservancy, Carol Miller from Wayne State, who will head the urban side of this, Don Uzarski, who's the wetland guru from Central Michigan, and Tom Zinnicki from uh, Michigan Environmental Council. And then here are some of the invited participants. So we really do have a, a wish list of some of the folks that are most active in geological and groundwater activities in the state of Michigan and beyond. So we're very happy to have uh, these lists of people participating in the summit. And we hope to report back shortly after the summit and provide that information uh, out to the, to the state, uh, to NOAA, and certainly to Flow as well on uh, some of our, our, our report activities and findings. So I'm gonna uh, kind of switch over to the second part, which is uh, Ottawa County is facing a groundwater crisis. No surprise after what you've listened to previously. For those not familiar with Ottawa County, it's down here shaded in yellow in the southwestern part of the state. And if we blow up the county, not, not literally, but um, look at the different townships, it turns out that due to the aquifer formations in the county, it's the middle part of the state that is really facing the greatest crisis around there. Uh, as I'll show you in this next slide, if we take a cross section of the county's glacial formations, we can see there's a relatively thin uh, section of till along here, glacial drift in the upper part of the, um, of the county. And then below that is this clay lens or this aquaclude there that prevents migration between the, uh, up and down uh, in the county. And then uh, what's happened is as people have uh, put in uh, boreholes in the glacial drift, they're starting to run out of water in this area and it's no longer sustainable. So they're drilling deeper and deeper and they're getting down into the Marshall Formation, which sits on an uh, old seabed. And as a consequence, the water in this aquifer, the groundwater, is heavy in chlorides, it's saline water. And so we're starting to see chloride migration going up through these boreholes and up into uh, this largely agricultural area. Now, Ottawa County itself is one of the fastest growing counties in the state, depending upon which period of record you use. It's either the fastest growing or the second fastest growing. And in the middle of the state where we have these issues, uh, there's heavy population growth as well as heavy agricultural intensity. 
And that is uh, accounting for this uh, decline in available groundwater. And as a consequence, the migration of chloride up into these wells and uh, creating a real issue about sustainability. So if we look at where the wells are in the county, we can see on the west side, here's Lake Michigan on the far west. On the west side, it's largely wells that are into the uh, glacial drift. And then on the, as we head further east uh, towards Grand Rapids, this Grand Rapids, Michigan, not Minnesota, we get more of the deeper wells that are going down into the Marshall Formation. And that's where these issues, these groundwater crises are really starting to emerge. And then some of the modeling study that was done by Michigan State University shows very nicely, if we look at the upper panel here and water use progression, basically the amount of drawdown of the static water wells, we're seeing that uh, by 2015, over a period of 45 to 50 years, uh, the drawdown has been upwards of 40 to 50 feet in some of these wells. And of course, that coincides very nicely with the amount of water use in that particular area as well. And then if we look at the static water level, which is the water level uh, in your well when the pump is not active, we can see this decline of up to 40 to 50 feet in some of the areas over that 50 year period. And obviously that is a huge drawdown and creating um, a lot of concern within the county. As I mentioned, if we're looking here on the right at this, at this map actually has two layers of data. If you look on the background, which is the colored blobs going from uh, blue to yellow to orange, that represents um, the drawdown in the, in, the, in the water levels in the wells. And we can see again in meters anywhere from 40 to 50 feet right in that middle here. And then uh, that amoeba-like formation kind of spreads out throughout the entire county. But right on top of that, if we look at the dots, is the amount of chloride in the wells. And Michigan has a standard of 250 milligrams per liter or parts per million. And we can see most of these wells in the middle part of the state uh, are at least at 250, if not going higher, up to 500. And while um, you can take the chloride out of your drinking water well, if you wanted to with a series of filters, if you're using it for agricultural purposes, it's much more difficult. And so there's a lot of concern for the agricultural activity that are based on these wells as to whether we're gonna burn some of the crops and lose some of the yield as a consequence. If we look at the percentage of wells with chloride levels of, uh, over that standard of 250 parts per million, we can see that it was pretty steady up through about 2000. And then as the well intensities increased, it's not, it's not a purely monotonic increase, but certainly the regression trend shows an increase over time in the percentage of wells that, have that, uh, that exceed that threshold of 250 milligrams per liter. Again, all of that suggesting that there's some real concern uh, in Ottawa County and that we needed to do something about it. So if we take a, a look at the historic data modeling results from MSU, we see that there's this thick layer of continuous clay deposits that forms that aquitard uh, that prevents that recharge from the glacial and bedrock aquifers. As a consequence, um, with increased pumping, they've had to go down into the bedrock um, and the water levels, static water levels have declined and the chloride concentrations have increased with that pumping from the, uh, from the Marshall formations. And then as that's happened the, with the chloride concentrations increasing in those townships right in the middle part of the county, there's growing concern. Nottawa County has really uh, been on trying to be on top of this, but the problem is not just in Ottawa County. This is existing throughout the state of Michigan where we start seeing chloride concentrations exceeding 250 milligrams per liter. In the Saginaw Basin, in lower Southeast Michigan, uh, this is all problematic uh, in the state given the way that these glacial drift tends to be very thin towards the, towards the Great Lakes, whether it's Lake Huron, Lake Erie, or Lake Michigan. Um, and as Kerry showed, we had that much deeper sediment deposits in the middle part or northern middle part of the northern peninsula, the lower peninsula, northern part of the lower peninsula. So as I said, Ottawa County has been very active. They want a uh, proactive about this. They recognize the problem. They want to get ahead of the problem. And so over the last few years, they've been reaching out to different stakeholder groups to develop this water management and conservation plan. Uh, they, these are the different elements that are part of the plan with a uh, heavy emphasis on education and outreach to let people know what the problems are, uh, developing water conservation strategies. And you know, one of the biggest problems we face here is, is more of a social problem than a technical problem in the sense that here you have a county abutting uh, you know, one of the most abundant surface water supplies in the world in, in the form of Lake Michigan. How do you convince people to conserve water? 
when they can see all this surface water right in their backyard. Uh, research and monitoring is an important part of this. Uh, we're hoping to set up a series of monitoring wells around the county to figure out what's going on and uh, figure out trends. Obviously reviewing policies and updates and then uh, working closely uh, on land use and infrastructure planning in the county to figure out what the solutions are. For those people that are interested, please go to this website um, and get more information. There's some tremendous videos. Uh, there's also the reports that are available, both MSU reports and the county plans. And um, I, I just give a lot of credit to, uh, to Paul Sachs and his group at the, at the planning department in, in Ottawa County for the work that they've done and bringing all the people together to try and come up with a consensus around planning for this problem. And you know, while it's specific to Ottawa County, as I mentioned earlier, this really uh, can be a template for some of the other counties around the state that are facing these problems or will face these problems in the future. And we hope uh, with the help of folks like Flo and, and sending out these reports and increasing the attention and visibility around this problem, more people will start to see that this, this issue, uh, even though it's out of sight, really cannot, we can't afford for it to be out of mind. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Dave. Thank you, Al. Um, we have a couple of questions for Carrie, which I'll start with. Um, Carrie, Emily Baker said, asks, talking of glacial sediments, could I hear your opinion of the impact on the dune and other shoreline from the recent high water levels and wave power this past year, and also their related ecosystems? Sure. And thank you for restarting my video. <laughs> um, I saw that question in the chat and yeah, it's record high in Lake Superior and every place downstream. And what, what we're seeing in Lake Superior and in Wisconsin is increase in landslides of more clay material and bluff retreat into the lake basins. And I'm sure that the dunes are similarly being impacted. I was there two years ago. So um, it's a natural cycle, it's a natural progression. It's especially problematic where cities like Chicago are right up against the water. And so is some of their major roadway infrastructure. Um, I think the best we can do, what we're doing in Minnesota and coordinating a little bit with Wisconsin is mapping areas of bluff retreat with some of the um, Great Lakes money so that local zoning ordinances can consider the retreat rates when they're establishing zoning. It's too late in a lot of cases, the homes are already there, the infrastructure is already there. And in th those cases, we're working more closely with our county emergency managers so that they can anticipate where these um, problems might create threats to infrastructure like hospitals or pipelines and impact human lives. So it's, in some places, it's at that point where we have to deal with the emergency managers and we can no longer keep this from happening, but hopefully we can zone more wisely in the future. But in Minnesota, at least the locals have zoning control. So the best you can do is educate them. Thanks. Um, there's a question from Jim Milne that I think any one of the three of us might wanna jump at, but let me uh, read it to you and then we can decide. Only a small portion of Michigan's glacial geology has been mapped in three dimensions. Other states have mapped their geology in 3D and are seeing a return on their investment of up to 30 to one. Uh, he asks, does Flow have a position on increasing funding for 3D mapping and how do we manage our aquifers when they aren't mapped? Al, I was, Al, I was wondering if you could take that first in terms of the mapping issue and monitoring issue. Well, I think it's definitely needed, and I think it's a very worthwhile investment. Uh, you know, obviously that falls within the domain of USGS and the Michigan Geological Survey. So, I would be very surprised if John Yelich, uh, the director of the Michigan Geological Survey, isn't focused on that as well. Um, and Jim may know that already, uh, but yeah, I I would strongly encourage us to continue moving in that direction. And I don't think you'd get any debate from any geologist in this state or in the basin regarding that. What we really need to do is not just Michigan, but make sure that it's, it's basically contiguous throughout the whole basin because these aquifers don't stop at municipal geographic lines. Yeah, my experience working with the legislature has been that the least, uh, the lowest priority is data collection and research and monitoring. But do you have any idea, Al, what the price tag might be for comprehensive um, mapping of our glacial geology in Michigan? It would be expensive, but I don't have an absolute cost on that. It's so it's so worth it. Actually, there are some costs that were presented in the um, 
uh, Michigan Water Use Advisory Council's 2020 report that was just released this week. And I think they're estimating about 3 million a year for the geologic mapping portion of it. And that's a bargain. It really, um, before you can do 3D maps, you need some fundamental two-dimensional and one-dimensional work. And Minnesota and Michigan benefited from the early mapping of people like Leverett and Farrand and Flint. And a lot of the understanding of Michigan hasn't really um, progressed beyond those maps from the 40s and 50s, um, starting in the 20s to 40s and 50s. So there's a lot of catch up to do in Michigan. And in part, this was because of the structure of where your geological survey was. I know this just from working with the Great Lakes Mapping Coalition. The survey was embedded in the DNR, and I think it was under oil and gas for a while. And that just meant that they got very little money. Um, they've recently been removed from that superstructure and are on their own, but without funding. So they don't have a lot of staff. So a million to three million a year would be really good for just some of the drilling and fundamental data collection that needs to be done. A lot of this can be gathered from water well records if drillers are submitting those to the state. Um, then you need to start looking at your ex expanding that to 3D mapping and then the aquifer properties. But the fundamentals really still need to be done. And I'm really happy that Alan Kihu and Yelich are, are working on this. Yeah. Well, the, the well drillers do to, um, put their information in well logic. You know, there's a question of how rigorous those data are. That's, that's a whole other issue. And the, you know, the 3 million cost estimate doesn't include the rigorous 3D modeling. So that would be much more expensive, but certainly for the base modeling to get the kind of one and 2D stuff that Carrie's referring to is absolutely essential to update that because there have been a lot of changes that have gone on over the last 70 years. Yeah, and yeah that question. report looks like it recommends money for EGLE, is that how you say your acronym for that? Um, EGLE, right. it, it has a lot of different funding lines that are recommended. I was just referring to what was the base funding for this survey. Right. Yeah, and Flo would definitely support uh, increasing funding for this purpose. Al, there's a question for you from David Wolf, who asks, has hydraulic fracturing had any impact on migration of high salinity water, or is that a likely consequence? Well, in, not in Ottawa County, there's, there's, the fracking is mostly up in the, you know, in your part of the world, Dave, um, in, in the northern part of the lower peninsula. And, um, you know, the fracking fluid is probably more problematic than hitting into the high saline areas uh, at, in terms of how that's deposited and, and brought back up after it's used to open up the, uh, open up the fractures in the geology. I, that area doesn't face the same problems with the Marshall Formation, but it, you know the fracking itself has a whole other suite of issues that, that can be addressed separately. I uh, just had a note from Tom Zimnicki. He said the $3 million figure is by county, not statewide, I guess. So it's a big, a big difference. Um, Barbara Stammer maybe asked, Go ahead, sorry. Maybe Kelly, maybe Kelly could put the link to that report if he can find it in the chat. Good idea. The Michigan Water Use Advisory Council's 2020 report. Okay. I had a question for Barbara Stammers for me, which is, doesn't Michigan have a law that it's regulation of contaminants? In this case, groundwater contaminants cannot be stronger than federal regulation. It is true that we have a law that passed in 2018 that says Michigan, it says where, where there is a federal standard for environmental protection, the state cannot go beyond it. But if there is a not a federal standard, the state can do so. Um, and uh, an example would be the contaminant, maximum contaminant levels for PFAS. There was no federal standard. So Michigan was free to go ahead with uh, a stronger state standard. I'm trying to see if there's any other questions. Um, I don't see any others. We have another minute or two if there are for a question. It'd be so nice to be able to see who's in the room. <laughs> uh, so there's no other questions. Al or Carrie, do you have anything further you'd like to add before we? Just thank you, Dave and Liz and Carrie um, for, you know, and Nate for help on the uh, IT side of things for, for doing this, putting this together. It's really been instructive for me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks to both of you for taking the time to be with us. It's been great. And please look for my email in the chat and follow up with me if you would like to be part of our study. We would like to talk to whoever feels like they're the ones in charge in or, you know, has has the soft power in your state. Great. Well, thanks again. Appreciate it very much.
Bye. Bye.